Hi, and welcome to our run through of the evolution of flight in birds. I'm going to go ahead and begin here. This is where students go ahead and start. And I'm going to start up here at this number one, introducing flight. I'll click on that and we'll let some stuff load. All right, so we're kind of thinking about animals, how they survive, how they evolve. And we're going to think about how birds are just a little bit different. Obviously, birds are all about flight. It gets them from one place to another. That doesn't mean there aren't some flightless birds out there. But we're going to be focusing on flight today, and we're going to be thinking about how organisms fly. Now, here we see a group of organisms which I wouldn't necessarily say fly, but these are organisms that might fly or glide in some limited manner. And we can see here we have things like flying frogs, flying squirrels, spiderlings which can parachute, and flying fish. If we think about flight in the sense of birds, we might think about powered flight. And powered flight has evolved in four separate groups. Obviously those are the insects, the bats, the birds, and the pterosaurs, which we see down below here. So we're going to be focusing on birds in particular. Now, obviously, there's a fair amount of bird diversity, and we can see a little bit of that here. This does, of course, include flightless birds as well as birds that possess flight. Today, we are focusing on flight. It is kind of a key characteristic of birds, even if it has been lost in some groups. And so we want to kind of take a look at the fossil record and figure out how we can understand bird evolution as a result of it. We're going to begin here in Germany. And there is a particular fossil found in 1861 that was of great importance. That fossil is Archaeopteryx. And so this was found in a particularly interesting site. And there are a few of these sites around the world. You can see here it's described as a tropical lagoon. Uh, the importance of this is that sometimes very fine sediments lead to fossils that preserve very delicate features that may not be preserved in other places. So if you're going to find something like feathers, or if you were looking at mammals, evidence of hairs, you'd need to find them in particular locations. So let's take a look at Archaeopteryx. Now, obviously with Archaeopteryx, it had a mouthful of teeth. That seems like a very reptilian characteristic. A long bony tail, again, sounds like something we'd find on a reptile like a lizard and not on a bird. And it had these claws on its feet. So all of this kind of says, hey, this thing seems like a reptile of some kind, but it had feathers. So the thing about this is the presence of feathers was something interesting and unique. And therefore, people kind of got thinking about the evolution of birds. So this particular thing, its name Archaeopteryx means ancient wing, suggesting that this is an ancient bird or some kind of transitional fossil between the um, reptiles and the birds. And we kind of want to figure out exactly where organisms like this fit in and how we got to having birds from a time period when there weren't any. So obviously Archaeopteryx, as well as living birds, are going to share reptilian characteristics with other organisms, in particular dinosaurs. So we're going to be focusing on dinosaurs in this exercise. And here we can see a phylogenetic tree with some representatives. We have things like Herrerasaurus towards the bottom, Triceratops as we get up towards the top. We have things like Archaeopteryx next to the bird there. And in between, dinosaurs that may be a little bit more bird-like or a little bit less bird-like depending on where they are. Obviously, we saw a picture of Velociraptor on our lab page, and Coelophysis is another kind of bird-looking dinosaur in comparison to organisms like Triceratops. So as we think about this, we want to kind of take a look at some of the major groups within the dinosaurs, and we can kind of put boxes around here to think about which organisms belong to a particular group. So in this case, we see organisms we would consider to be dinosaurs, and that is everything that we see on our current phylogenetic tree. If we were to include some organisms outside of this, we would start including things like the pterosaurs and the crocodilians. So when we think about dinosaurs, we've got a couple of key characteristics that we might recognize as being associated with all dinosaurs. 
they have a particular kind of hip that has a hole in that hip socket and they have a grasping thumb. Obviously there's quite a bit of variation in dinosaur hands but these are kind of some of the basics that we would have to recognize them as being different than their other relatives. Now as we exclude a few of these dinosaurs we get into a group referred to as the Cerishian dinosaurs. These are the what we call lizard hipped dinosaurs. And if we think about the characteristics of this group, they have a long flexible neck, they have a longer second finger, and a curved thumb claw. So we're going to kind of link all of these organisms together. They are still dinosaurs. They just happen to be Cerishian dinosaurs as opposed to belonging to another group. Now if you return to our homepage for this exercise in the lab, you'll see that there are some alternative hypotheses as far as placing some of these organisms. So a slightly smaller box is going to present us with what we refer to as the theropods or the beast foot dinosaurs. Again, we're recognizing those here as Cerishians. We're recognizing them as dinosaurs, but a subset of those groups are the theropods recognized by this head with a wide range of motion, a flexible lower jaw, an enlarged pelvis, and a reduced number of fingers. And then here we have a group referred to as the Manoreptorans. So this group is going to be those that have these seizing hands. And you can see here that the hands are longer than the feet. So that's kind of one of the big characteristics. They also have very long arms to reach out with. And they have what's referred to as a semi-lunate or half-moon wrist bone, which increases the motion of the wrist. So these are all important characteristics that make the Manoreptorans a little bit different than the theropods that are not included in this group. But just as a reminder, every Manoraptor in here is a theropod. Every theropod is a member of the Cerishians, and every one of those is a member of the dinosaurs overall. All right, finally, we get to the group here we're recognizing as birds. Now, exactly where we draw this box is up for debate. You can see here they've included Archaeopteryx. We don't necessarily have to do that. Um, and we could place that so it just includes the pigeons. But obviously these organisms are Manoraptorans. They have the same basic characteristics as they do. They are theropods. They are Cerishians. They are dinosaurs. They're just going to have a extra set of characteristics, particularly once we get into the birds proper that are going to be things that might be missing from some of the other Manoraptorans. All right, so key thing here, birds fly. We want to get into how did that flight evolve? I'm going to go ahead and answer a few questions here. Powered flight has evolved in several groups. It has evolved in the birds, insects, bats, and pterosaurs, so I'm going to select all of the above. Archaeopteryx was an amazing find. Well, its name does mean ancient wing. That doesn't mean that that's why it's an amazing find. It had a skeleton with reptilian features, such as a long tail and a mouth full of teeth. That's kind of definitely interesting. Uh, the skeleton had feathers and wings. Well, it's actually really kind of the combination of B and C that made it an amazing find. It's like, it's kind of like a bird. And it's kind of like a non-avian reptile, so a reptile that is not a bird. And so I would select B and C, recognizing those as being the important characteristics. It's a mix of reptile in a traditional sense and bird having those feathers. All right, scientists agree that birds actually are dinosaurs. Well, why do they agree to this? It doesn't really matter how Velociraptor ran. Um, not all dinosaurs have feathers, at least not as far as we know. Um, birds are warm-blooded, so being cold-blooded doesn't make any sense. All of the above is then out. It's all about sharing anatomical features. And again, looking for homologies is how we're going to actually put groups together from an evolutionary perspective. All right, because of the many shared skeletal features, birds can be considered, well, we already talked about this. They are dinosaurs, and that fits with all of these groups. They are recognized as Cerishian dinosaurs. Within the Cerishians, they are recognized as being theropods. 
Within the theropods, they are recognized as being Manoraptorans. So in this case, we would select all of those, A, B, and C. So it is a member of each of these groups. Birds belong to multiple groups. We could even go further back. Obviously, we recognize birds as reptiles. We recognize all reptiles, along with the mammals, as being amniotes. We recognize those, along with the amphibians, as being tetrapods and so on. So every time we think about group membership, each organism belongs to many groups. As you head back in evolutionary history, you get more and more members in those groups. All right, so well, it looks like we're ready to go full speed ahead into our next unit. So in this case, we're gonna be looking at flight features and we're gonna go ahead and just click on these one at a time to take a look at what's going on. We'll start here. And it ends up that in birds, we have hand and finger bones reduced in number and fused together. So this is one of our key characteristics of bird anatomy. We can say the hand and finger bones are reduced and fused. If we take a look here, we have that wrist bone we were talking about. So we have a wrist with a rounded bone giving it additional motion. This is what we call the semilunate wrist bone. As we think about the shoulder socket, well, the shoulder socket is going to be directed upwards and outwards to allow for the kind of flight motion that they have. And this is going to be distinctly different than reptiles that walk on the ground where that shoulder socket is going to be directed downwards. So this is kind of a key characteristic here, allowing for those wings to do that flapping motion that allows for flight. We have here clavicles, which we sometimes refer to as the collarbones fused into a wishbone. So this is gonna be a site of muscle attachment and there are a couple of key characteristics here of birds that are really all about securing these flight muscles. The other one here would be the enlarged sternum. So the sternum is enlarged in birds to give them a big area for muscle attachment and that's one of the things we can always figure out when we take a look at bones. As we have bones with enlarged flat surfaces or ridges, it's probably indicating that we have more musculature attached to those. Okay. And finally, number six here, when we're thinking about bones in birds in general, they are gonna be these kind of hollow, thin-walled, air-filled bones that kind of allow the bones to be strong, but also light. So we wanna think about these thin-walled bones as being a key characteristic of birds, which allows them to fly. Now, of course, the interesting thing about these characteristics is that we don't know where exactly they came about. That's part of our investigation we're going to continue doing here. So, what happened in dinosaurs to eventually allow for the evolution of birds? That's kind of what we're taking a look at here, and we want to take a look at some features. So we're going to start off with a bipedal stance to walk on two legs, and we have to figure out where this feature would map to this phylogenetic tree. So in this case, we're going to have illustrations of various dinosaurs on here. Now, this looks a little bit weird because all of these are bipedal except for Triceratops here. So as we think about bipedalism, bipedalism appeared early. It was lost in some organisms that became quadrupeds, things that walk on four legs. But we're going to go ahead and put this bipedalism characteristic here at the base of the dinosaur tree, recognizing that the ancestral dinosaurs walked on two legs. Okay, so in this case, we are inferring that bipedalism appeared in the ancestors of all dinosaurs, given that the oldest dinosaurs are bipedal, and of course, many dinosaurs are bipedal. All right, so we'll go ahead and take a look at our second characteristic. Our second characteristic here is all about the hands, and we're looking for a long digit. So we can see here that we've got numbered digits and we can take a look at different kinds of digits within our various dinosaurs on our phylogenetic tree. And we can start to try to figure out when exactly it is that we had a shift in finger length. So if we take a look at Platyosaurus here, we can see in this case that it's going to be the second finger that is the longest. This big thumb-like finger over here is digit number one. And so number two is the longest, but number three is the longest in Triceratops and Herrerasaurus. So we have a shift at that point of Platyosaurus. 
And we're going to recognize this as being the Sorishians, having a particular characteristic of that longer second digit. So we'll go ahead and map that one there with the Sorishians. Our next feature is going to be thin walled bones. And so the question is, when did thin walled bones come about? Well, we can see here that it looks like Coelophysis is the first of these organisms to have thin bones. Therefore, as we think about this, I would go ahead and suggest that those thin walled bones evolved here with that common ancestor of all theropod dinosaurs. All right, looks like our next characteristic is finger reduction. So in this case, originally dinosaurs had five fingers, and we can kind of see that, although there's a couple of them being pretty small here on Herrerasaurus, a little bit bigger on Triceratops there. But we get a reduction in number as we head on in again to Coelophysis. So we're going to go ahead and place that right there, recognizing again that the theropods not only have that longer second digit, but also have a reduced number of digits in general. Our next characteristic is a wishbone, one of those key characteristics for anchoring those muscles of flight. And we have to think about where those appeared. Looks like Platyosaurus has two separate clavicles, just like we do, but Coelophysis here has a wishbone structure. So again, it's theropods that have this key bird characteristic, even though birds don't evolve until way down here. All right, how about an enlarged sternum? we've got a little bit of a problem here. Okay, so one of the things is we don't have a sternum from Coelophysis, and that's just part of how fossilization works. Oftentimes we don't get all of the parts of a dinosaur. Some of that depends on what those conditions were for fossilization. So in this case, it looks like Velociraptor certainly has one, but we're just not kind of certain about Coelophysis. So in this case, I would go ahead and place this characteristic here at the Manoraptorans. Now, obviously, there's the potential for future information to let us know that some members of the earlier theropods also had an enlarged sternum, and we could perhaps change this hypothesis. All right, so here we have that semilunate or half moon shaped wrist bone, and it looks like that first appears here up in Velociraptor. So we can go ahead and map that to the Manoraptorans again. And that indicates that we've got some key characteristics evolving just as a dinosaur characteristic in general, such as bipedalism. Some characteristics appear with the Sorishians or the Theropods or the Manoraptorans, but they're appearing at different times seemingly. Now, as far as the shoulder socket, we know that it has to face up and out to allow for that flapping of the wing to allow for flight to occur. And we can kind of mention this here as facing up like this. Obviously, there are some other potential orientations. It can be directly outwards, or we can have some facing downwards, such as we would have in something walking on the ground in a quadrupedal fashion. So in this case, we want to take a look and see what's going on. Looks like we have a downward pointed shoulder socket all the way up here through Coelophysis, one of those early theropods. We have here Velociraptor with something facing out and only in the bird is it really kind of in an upward tilted positioning. So as we think about mapping this on here, we want to start off with this switch from down to out, which looks like it occurred with the Manoraptorans again, with Velociraptor being our particular example. All right, so let's review what we've done so far. This isn't too big of a deal. Looks like we've got some very different fossils here of something with some saber teeth. Now, as I head back, I see that there are no longer any saber teeth here. So as we look at this, suppose we found long fang-like teeth in C, D, and E. Where do we map the earliest appearance of this feature? Well, that feature would have evolved somewhere after B split off, but before the existence of C, D, and E. So it would have to be this position in here. We always recognize that that new trait evolved somewhere in the common ancestor of all of those that have it. So do we have direct evidence that mapping this feature is correct? Well, that's a little bit tricky. 
I'm gonna say no, we don't have direct evidence. We maybe don't have the entire tree, but we can infer that the fangs evolved somewhere along that line. We don't know exactly where, and we're not sure what the first organism was that had those fangs. All right, so let's imagine that we found a spot fossil species F here. Okay, that's fair enough. We don't have its jaw because it's an incomplete fossil. But if we have another, uh, enough other characteristics to link it in here to being closely related to C, we're going to anticipate that since it came from the same common ancestor that we think evolved those fangs, that this one would have fangs. So again, we're able to make an inference based on its placement on the tree and what we know about the common ancestor of C and F. All right, so how about this one? What can we infer from the skeletal features mapped on this cladogram? This is the one we've been working on, trying to place those characteristics at various branches on our phylogenetic tree, taking a look at the evolution of flight in birds. Well, let's take a look at number A or letter A. All flight features evolved all at once. Man, it, it, it clearly does not look like that. Okay, flight features evolved at different times. Well, it looks like they did. Bipedalism back there at the base of the dinosaurs. We've got some kind of shifts in the um, digits, some occurring with the Cerisians, some occurring with the theropods. We've got obviously some characteristics like the shoulder socket shifting at the Manoraptorans. So we've got all these kinds of shifts. It looks like B is pretty well supported. How about all flight features were present in the earliest dinosaurs? Clearly no way. No flight features were present before birds. Well, obviously a bunch of the features that are essential for flight were present before birds. So I'm gonna go ahead and go with B. So in this case, we do recognize that the features necessary for flight evolved over a long time period with various features popping up at various branches along the way. All right, the functions of each of the skeletal features we explored are associated with flight, but many appear quite early in the dinosaur lineage. With this information, we can infer that, hmm, let's see, most of the features were unimportant. Well, that's clearly not true. We have things like the enlarged sternum and the wishbone, which are obviously essential for flight muscles, which appeared at different times. Clearly, they are important. Very early dinosaurs could probably fly. That doesn't seem very likely. Um, we don't have the evidence of the feathers and they're missing some of the characteristics because they didn't evolve until later. The features originally served a function other than flight. Well, that seems like a definite possibility. Um, the only feature that matters is the shoulder. Well, again, that's untrue. It doesn't matter if your shoulder is anatomically correct if you don't have the necessary places for muscles to attach to allow you to fly. So I'm gonna go with C. We're gonna expect that these features maybe were doing something else prior to the evolution of flight. All right, so another section down. Looks like we are ready to move on ahead. And we're gonna take a look at feathers. So obviously feathers are an important characteristic associated with flight. It ends up that feathers may do more than just flight. So we're gonna go ahead and click on this bird and wow, it's, it's kind of ugly without feathers. So first of all, obviously feathers make it so birds don't look freaky. Uh, it's probably not an important characteristic, but let's see what we can take a look at. So there are two types of feathers that insulate the body. We've got these insulating feathers up here We've got them kind of close to the body here to help it retain its body heat. These can be either downy or semi-plume. We can see this downy feather here. It's kind of loose. We might use this in pillows or sleeping bags. And we have the semi-plume, which is similar, but it does have this supporting structure, the, the rachis that is going up the middle of this thing. So we've got a little bit more sturdy of a insulating type feather. All right, so question is, what's our next kind of feather? We've got here something called a contour feather. And when we look at a bird, most of the feathers we see, other than those in the wing, are gonna be the contour feathers. They give the bird its overall shape, its coloration, and things along those lines. 
So if we click on some contour feathers, they have the rachis here, they have barbs sticking off to the side. If we get closer, here's our barb with little structures off to the side of this, and we call those barbules. Now these are going to allow these things to lock into each other, giving this feather this kind of rigidity. If you've ever played with a feather, you can kind of unzip and then stroke back together the individual barbs of a feather. And so these are sort of locking together much in the same way that we might do with, say, Velcro. All right, so contour feathers, what are they used for? Well, obviously they are colored, they allow for different appearances, they allow for birds to recognize each other. They can be used to attract mates, so they can sometimes get pretty fancy as far as that color goes. And of course, maybe you don't wanna look fancy, maybe you'd rather blend in, so they're gonna allow for camouflage as well. All right, flight feathers are our next kind of feather. I wonder what those are for. Probably for, yeah, you guessed it, flight. And when we think about these things, flight feathers are obviously going to be used to provide some lift. So we can click on the wing here and get an idea of what's going on with the flight feathers. Obviously the rachis here is going to extend out from the bird. We have a leading edge which is a little bit compressed and a longer trailing edge here. This gives them an asymmetrical appearance. So one of the key things about this is that contour feathers are going to be symmetrical. But in order to product, actually produce lift to allow for flight, you have to have asymmetrical feathers. So we can kind of get an idea of how these things situate themselves in the wing. Obviously towards the air is going to be the leading edge and the trailing edge is back there kind of towards the back side of the wing. So we want to kind of get an idea of what's going on here. We're going to take a look at one more feather type just to get an idea of something that we find within the fossil record. We have these filamentous feathers here. So filamentous feathers are kind of something that obviously is not going to be used for flight. Uh, we don't tend to see this in most of our birds today. Um, but it's not super different maybe from the downy feathers in some ways. It's just that it doesn't have that kind of centralized structure. So here we can see kind of an individual filament of those filamentous feathers. So they look somewhat similar again to downy feathers, but not exactly the same. All right, so we want to go ahead and map these feathers onto here. So here we have theropod dinosaurs, the ones that we have found some feathers in. And in order to map these things on here, we've got to kind of get some names on here of various organisms. We can kind of see what's going on as far as the presence of downy feathers. So we can think about where we think downy feathers first popped up. Obviously we've got some here, we've got some here, and here in birds. So it looks as if we could go with the Manoraptorans as having the presence of downy feathers of some kind. Now again, it's possible that they were earlier on, but we'll have to think about what the evidence suggests to us. Now it looks like the same group has contour feathers. So we can go ahead and place contour feathers again with the Manoraptorans. Now, as far as flight feathers, we don't have any evidence of that in Manoraptorans. It looks like that comes later here within what we do recognize as the birds, including things like Archaeopteryx. So that is a characteristic that links Archaeopteryx to the true birds that we have today, um, presence of flight feathers. Now, if we take a look even further back, filamentous feathers are found throughout tons of different groups here and looks as if they evolved back here with the theropod, so they would be recognized as the earliest kind of feather. All right, so let's go ahead and do a little review. Feathers can be used for insulation, sure. Display, yeah. Protection, they can help you blend in for flight, so they are useful for all of the above. Feathers, well, they were definitely there before Archaeopteryx. They haven't been found in all dinosaurs first appear as thin filaments and later evolve into more elaborate structures. That sounds good. Are used only for flight? That's definitely false. So we're going to go with C here. Based on direct evidence, we mapped the most likely first appearance of contour feathers on the cladogram as shown, okay, with the Manoraptorans. 
We have not found contour feathers in all of the Manoraptorans, but we can infer that, well, some of them definitely did have them, so some of them probably did. Well, they definitely had them because others do. That's a possibility. They may have had them, but they have not been found in the fossil record yet, or that they appear only in birds. Well, it seems likely that if contour feathers evolved here, that we would have them in all of these cases. So what another possibility would be is that we're placing this maybe in the wrong positioning, and maybe they had them, but there might be some that didn't. I would tend to go with C here, suggesting that it's likely that they existed in the ones where we haven't found them. But it's always possible that they didn't, either because we are incorrectly placing the common ancestor that had those, or because some of those organisms may have lost them. So that's another possibility. All right, here we have another cladogram. Shows the likely first appearance of the four feather types. What can we infer from this evidence? Well, feathers only serving a single function? No way. Feathers evolved for a flight? Well, they did eventually once we got those asymmetrical flight feathers. Feathers served other functions in non-flying dinosaurs, or there have been no changes in the appearance of feathers over time. Looks like only C makes any sense here. So we know that they could be used for insulation, they might be used for display or camouflage, and of course later on for flight. All right, we're ready to go ahead. And we'll take just a little bit of a look at what flight is and a couple of forces that are associated with it. Obviously for a plane to fly, it has to overcome its weight. It has to overcome its drag, which is pulling it kind of backwards. It's going to have to provide thrust in order to do that and it's gonna to have to develop lift somehow. So these are the same basic forces we would talk about with birds. Obviously we can see air flowing over a wing here and we can get an idea of how that's going to happen. We're gonna develop a low pressure over the top of the wing, a high pressure below it, which is going to cause that upward lift. Okay, well it ends up birds aren't exactly airplanes. There's no engine on the back, they don't push themselves forward via fart power or anything like that. So the wings are gonna to have to do something a little bit different. They're gonna generate lift and thrust, that is that they're gonna be able to pick them up but also be able to propel them forward and they're gonna do that through their flapping motion. So first thing we wanna look at is wing size and see how important that is. So the area of a bird's wing is directly related to the flight forces it can generate. Larger wings, more flight forces. Obviously, generally speaking, we see bigger birds having bigger wings, but a lot of this depends on what that bird is going to be doing. So, problem is in the fossil record, we don't get to always see this wing, but we can get the arm bones perhaps. So, longer arms mean bigger wings. So if we think about this, we can see a couple of birds here. We've got a big bird, we've got a small bird. Larger wing on the big bird than on the small bird. But it's not exactly clear what's going on as far as differences in their capacity to fly. Because these birds are obviously of a different size. They weigh different amounts, and we're not sure how much they weigh. So while the size of the arm bones tell us about the size of the wing, we need to have information about the size of the leg to be able to estimate the weight of the bird. So in this case, we're gonna go ahead and get that information on here as well. Now, as we think about this, the best flyers, the birds that are gonna kind of be able to fly for the longest or whatever, they're going to obviously have a light weight and a large wing. So as we're thinking about this, the length of a bird's arms relative to its leg bones are going to give us a pretty good idea of how well that bird could fly. So we kind of want to look at this and think about what's going on. If you want to, you can actually calculate this out, but we can look at squares here and I can basically say that this leg is one, two, three, four, five, six squares long. This one down here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and maybe a half. We could do the same with these arms, one, two, three, four, and a half. One, two, three, four, five, and a half. We could do some calculations and find out that roughly speaking, these 
birds are approximately equivalent. They may be different sizes, but they have basically the same ratio of leg to arm. And so they were equipped about equally well. All right, but we want to think about this as we're thinking about the evolution of flight. We know that this relationship matters. The longer your arm is relative to your leg, the more likely it is that you're able to actually be able to fly. And we can take a look at that as we look at these dinosaurs that we've seen before, and we can start to figure out how this ratio starts to change over time. So we're mapping where the arms became nearly as long as the legs, or even longer than the legs. And it looks like even when we get to the Manoraptorans, where we have these very long arms compared to a lot of other dinosaurs, the legs are still longer. But by the time we get to Archaeopteryx and the pigeon, we've got equal length. So really that's a bird characteristic, or at least a characteristic shared by modern birds and their relatives like Archaeopteryx. All right, so we've seen long arms mean greater wing area. Okay, we can generate thrust using those but we want to take a look at the motion of a wing and figure out what's important about that. It ends up we've already seen the skeletal characteristics that are necessary to understand how this is going to work. So if we think about that, we had a shoulder socket and we had a wrist joint. And both of those we talked about as being particular in shape and they both allow for a large range of motion. So if we take a look at that shoulder socket, we can kind of compare ourselves to a bird and think about how we would do this, getting into kind of a bird-like position, which might be a bit uncomfortable. We can try to lift our arms up and see if we can flap our wings in the same way that a bird can. Now it ends up that we can do okay. Our shoulder socket definitely faces out rather than down so much, so it's not the worst scenario. Uh, but we're not quite as good as a bird at doing this kind of thing. We don't have that upward facing shoulder socket. So again, we'll think about this. We've got that upward facing sh uh, shoulder socket of a bird up and out. And we can think about the Manoraptoran dinosaurs, how they have that facing in an outwards kind of direction. But if we go back to the base of the dinosaur tree, we have a lot of these facing downward, meaning that they're good for walking on the ground, not so good for producing any motion remotely like flight. So as we're thinking about this, we want to map the appearance of an outward kind of facing shoulder socket that shift from that standard downward facing one. And that happened in the Manoraptorans. So there was the evolution of a very different arm. Now that doesn't mean that these organisms were flying. It just means that this is where we got a shift from that ancestral characteristic of a downward pointing uh, shoulder socket to something that is using the arms for a different purpose. All right, now as far as the wrist joint goes, we can go ahead and think about that. The wrist joint is going to allow for a larger amount of movement in birds than we might get in ourselves. And so in this case, we can kind of figure out how this works out in us. We can place our hand down in, on the desk in front of us and try to bend our wrist to see how much movement we can get. Now, obviously this depends on how much motion you have. Having arthritis, I get almost no motion in this direction, but it ends up that humans don't get a ton of movement here at all. Um, so there's our range of motion, and we can kind of think about how this is set up. Weirdly enough, we talk about the birds as having a semi-lunate bone in their wrist. It ends up that we do have a lunate bone in our wrist. The primary movement at our wrist between that and our radius is actually formed by a bone called the scaphoid. Um, but we do have bones that are somewhat similar. Humans have a relatively mobile wrist. Uh, birds are going to have a greater range of motion and that again comes from that semi-lunate or half moon shaped bone in the wrist and that is going to allow for this to kind of um, get additional movement along with the shoulder to allow for flight to occur. Now if we take a look back here we can see that this particular characteristic evolved with the Manoraptorans. So much like the 
shoulder socket, this wrist motion comes from a time obviously prior to flight. Remember, we don't have the right limb proportions. Although the Manoraptorans are known for having long arms for dinosaurs, they still have longer legs than they do arms, so they wouldn't have been flying, but they're no longer using their arms for, say, walking on, so they were doing something different with them. All right, so if we think about this, we want to kind of get an idea of how birds can fly. We can kind of take a look at all of these kinds of characteristics together. And let's think about what we can kind of know now that we've kind of taken a look at this issue. As far as lift and thrust, the bird's wing must, of course, well, it needs a wide range of motion at the shoulder and it needs a wide range of motion at the wrist. So it has to also be large enough to generate sufficient force. It sounds like all of those are going to be true. These are all key characteristics to allow for flight. And we would need to find all of these if we were going to suggest that something is likely to be able to fly. Relative length of arms compared to legs is important in flight because it's really all about the size of the wing relative to the body weight. So this is kind of the key thing here that when we set up that ratio, if you have longer arms than legs, you're likely to be able to generate that lift. Increased range of motion in the shoulder and wrist. Well, yeah, they're important for the flight stroke. Well, probably did not evolve until after flight. Looked like they occurred in the Manoraptorans, which we know did not fly. Uh, probably provided some advantage before flight evolved. Well, why would they have evolved in the Manoraptorans? if they weren't providing some kind of advantage. So it sounds like A and C would be the correct answers here. That they did exist prior to flight. They were then used later for flight, but they must have been doing something else in those raptors. All right, so using the information shown in the cladogram, the increased range of motion necessary to develop a flight stroke first appeared in, well, it looks like that flight stroke could have occurred there in the Manoraptorans. The Manoraptorans have the necessary shoulder and wrist characteristics. What they lack is the proper limb proportions, so almost certainly they would be too heavy to fly even if we were looking at some of the smaller ones. All right, full speed ahead. Okay, it looks like we've got the vast majority of this taken care of. So before we start our special assignment, we're going to collect the data into a single table. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and make sure that all these characteristics pop into various locations. Obviously, we've got our bipedal stance down here with the dinosaurs. We have a long second digit as a Cerisian characteristic. Thin walled bones, reduced digit number, and it says here the furcula, this is our wishbone, which are going to be theropod characteristics. We've got our outward shoulder socket, the semilunate wrist bone, and an enlarged sternum all here as our Manoraptoran characteristics. Now we can go ahead and add our feathers to this and we can see here that the theropods had the first feathers, clearly not useful for flight. We have some more advanced feathers, the contour feathers and some insulating feathers here in the Manoraptorans, but no flight feathers here until we get to Archaeopteryx and the modern birds. All right, so we can go ahead and add our form and function here. And we can kind of think about the additional information we've got. Relatively long arms as compared to the legs, again, a bird characteristic. So it looks as if we have characteristics evolving over a long period of time. And then we get here some of the characteristics that are essential to flight, which finally allow flight to occur, but are based off of some of the earlier characteristics. All right, so our goal here is to develop a logical, well-supported hypothesis about how flight evolved. And that is kind of your task. You have to take all the information that we've learned and develop some kind of hypothesis about how flight occurred. So as you're thinking about this, you can do this on your own. We want to think about which features are associated with flight which ones are essential for flight, uh, when did each of these appear, 
And there are some other things we could also think about. Did these features evolve for a flight or were they serving some other function? We could kind of go all the way back to this idea of the bipedal nature of dinosaurs. And again, some of them did become quadrupeds, but to walk on your hind legs is something that might be valuable for running in some ways, kind of getting your head up to get a better view. So being bipedal serves its own function independent of flight, but what it does do is it frees up those arms to change in ways in which they can be used for different purposes. This kind of mirrors our own evolution as we think about us starting to walk upright, then the hands are available to do other things. Um, so anyway, this is your task. And that's where I think I'm going to go ahead and leave you, is you can go ahead and develop your hypothesis explaining how and when flight evolved.